So let's carry on talking about diffusing potential vorticity. We'll go back to our equation. We've only got one equation to look at this week. It's just this generic advection forcing dissipation equation. And so let's say that we represent, uh, as an isotropic diffusion, we represent the effect of transients on the potential vorticity field. And we have a source here as well. Now we're going to ask a slightly different question. We're going to look at very large scales in the ocean. Okay? And we're going to say, what is the effect of some diffusion of potential vorticity on the mean field of potential vorticity? It's useful to talk about potential vorticity in this context for two reasons, right? Because, firstly, potential vorticity is conserved following the motion. So that makes it a useful thing to talk about diffusing. And, and secondly, if you know the potential vorticity, then you also know the flow. So there's an intimate connection between the large-scale flow and the large-scale potential vorticity field, because uh, they are related. You can diagnose one from the other. Here's our diffusion of potential vorticity. And we're going to say that we have, on the large scale, we're going to take the model of steady non-divergent flow. So we're going to have, we're going to eliminate this time variation and we're just going to say um, that the flow is steady and non-divergent and unforced, right? So we're going to say we're in a region which is sheltered from wind stress forcing. So that's away from the surface of the ocean, in the deeper ocean, where you don't feel that effect. And there, all you've got is the effect of the transient eddies on the mean flow field, right? On the mean PV field. Okay, so you can take these two terms and, and you can set them as equal to one another. We're going to take a, a closed contour of flow and we're going to take an area integral of the term on the left-hand side. And that area integral through the divergence rule is going to be the line integral around that that contour of the flux of Q uh, perpendicular to the contour, okay? But since Q is constant on that contour, right, because we have unforced flow, then that is, you can take that Q outside the integral and it's just the line integral of the, of the flow perpendicular to the contour, which you can put back as an area integral of the divergence within that region. But since we said the flow was non-divergent, then that's going to be equal to zero. Right, so the left-hand side is equal to zero within a flow contour, which since we have free flow, it's also a steady free flow, it's also a Q contour. Right? So if the left-hand side is zero, then the right-hand side here must also be zero. So this, within the area, this, this divergence of K grad Q must be equal to, by the divergence rule, that is just um, the component of the Q gradient, which is perpendicular to the boundary, integrated around the boundary, and that must be zero, okay? So we've come up with the result now, which says that as you integrate around this, this flow contour, the gradient perpendicular to that contour must integrate to zero in steady, unforced flow. Now, what does that mean? If you look at this picture on the bottom here, that means if you have a flow contour, well, that, in this situation, obviously, that gradient perpendicular to that flow contour as you go around is not going to add up to zero. It's not going to integrate to zero, right? Which means that the eddies are going to transfer properties until such a point as that does become zero. And what that means is that this extremum here is going to get eroded and eliminated and you'll end up with a state in which the potential vorticity is uniform. It only has one value throughout the region. Uh, and so, yeah, when I say extremum of potential vorticity, that makes you think of the Rayleigh criterion, which we talked about when we were talking about instability, and, and it's linked. You know, if you have an extremum in potential vorticity, then you might have instability. Instability will generate transient flow. Transient flow will act to eliminate the source of that instability, and this is what's happening here. And, and the ultimate result is that you're going to eliminate all gradients of potential vorticity, and you'll have a state in which potential vorticity only has one value, a plateau of uniform PV, all right? And uh, here's a couple of examples. So here's an ocean model 
So it's not the top layer of the ocean, it's somewhere isolated from forcing, right? And you can see that the, there's a big region where the gyre is active of uniform potential vorticity, no gradients. All the gradients are pushed out to the edge where you have no flow. And here, this is represented here as a plot. Uh, as you go around the region, you can plot the values of Q on the vertical axis and the values of Psi on the horizontal axis. And it comes down to this kind of ultimate state where either there are variations in Q, but in that case, Psi is zero, so there's no flow. So that's just basically the beta effect outside the flow region. Or Psi is varying, which means there's flow, in which case Q is uniform. So that's within the gyre. And here's on the right, there's an example from the observations of ocean gyres. And again, the lower figure shows a deeper layer, and you can see those uniform values of potential vorticity. In the upper figure, we're, we're nearer the surface. It's, it's not isolated from forcing. And um, you can see that the Q value is not uniform, but it is enclosed contours around the gyre. So that's very different from the types of large-scale ocean circulation theories that you've seen up to now. And that's what I'm going to get on to now. We're going to talk about the large-scale ocean circulation, and we're going to contrast kind of two paradigms of large-scale ocean circulation. One, which is the one you know, okay, which is the Stommel solution, which is basically the Sverdrup term, which is the advection of planetary vorticity, is balanced by forcing and friction. Okay? That's the Stommel gyre. So what happens is that your contours of your potential vorticity are parallel to latitude lines. And you are, your flow is forced across those contours, forced to change its potential vorticity. As it goes south, it is forced by the wind stress. And as it goes back north, and it has to be in an intense jet so that this friction term can be big enough, um, uh, that friction term will then remove the vorticity that was injected by the wind stress, and you can go back in the other direction. So that is how a Stommel gyre works. It's forced and dissipated, and your vorticity, your absolute vorticity, is changing. Right? And here's the other extreme. Imagine a, an ocean gyre in which your potential vorticity is conserved. So you never change it. Uh, which means that as you go around a flow contour, uh, your PV contour is going to be parallel to that flow contour. You're not going to change your PV. You are in an unforced system, right? You're in a system where you have this V dot grad relative vorticity plus B to V is equal to zero. So there's a, the compensation here is between the advection of relative vorticity and the advection of planetary vorticity, and the two of them together are conserved. I mean, the, the PV is conserved, J psi Q is equal to zero, which means that your Q is strictly a function of your string function. Q is Q of psi, right? And remember that Q, are, well, uh, what we're calling our potential vorticity in this barotropic case, is the relative vorticity plus beta Y, and that is a function of psi. We don't know what that function is, but we can say that it is a function of psi. And that's the kind of opposite extreme view of the ocean circulation compared to the forced dissipative Stommel gyre. I and mean, that's called a Fofanoff gyre, right? And um, we imagine that it gets into this state, the ocean circulation gets into this state due to the action of transient eddies modifying the pot potential vorticity field. Just a last word on that. We don't know that relationship between Q and Psi, but the simplest thing to do is just to say that it's a linear relationship. So you can say that the gradient of Q is proportional to the gradient of Psi. And uh, then if we want to talk about that upper layer where we have some forcing, we can try to ask what, what is this relationship between Q and Psi. And I'm not going to spend much time on this because it's very much like what we've just done. But um, so if we put that forcing back on, we have a dissipative term and a forcing term, we can do that integral again around a closed Q contour. If Q is related to Psi, we can do the similar kind of analysis, and we end up with an expression which will give us that dQ by d Psi, the constant in that expression of proportionality between Q and Psi. 
And that will be determined by a balance between forcing and dissipation. And that will tell us uh, the strength of the gyre. Okay? The relationship between Q and Psi tells us how strong the flow is. So, that is, that is, so that's the other extreme uh, view of the ocean circulation.